And if he brings a power bar, then. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Wish me luck, you know? Are we live in there? Yeah. Oh, we're live? Okay. Uh, can you just tell her we might have a technical issue when we switch the, um, in the private chat, there's a private chat. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ask her, is the volume good? Because now we're only depending on this. Uh, is the volume OK? Huh, what'd she say? Yeah? OK. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير <laughs> All right, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma kfina bi halalika an haramik, wa agnina bi faddik amen siwak, ya wasi al maghfira. Allahumma inna nas aluka hubak, wa hubba man yu hibbuk, wa hubba amalan yu karibuna ila hubbik ya arhamar rahimin. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, uh, accept this coming together from us. We ask Allah to put barakah or blessing in whatever we learn today, inshallah. Um, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make um, the knowledge that we learn a healing for our hearts, inshallah ta'ala. Um, last week, this is our ninth session. So last week, um, we talked about tasting the sweetness of faith, right? And we talked about how uh, a person, mashallah. Um, you could pull it up. So, just one second, guys. We were just having a few technical issues. Uh, yeah, exactly. Jazakumullahu khair. All right, and then just switch the camera back. Oh, it's good. It's already good. Inshallah. I think we're good. Okay, sorry about that. So, last week we talked about tasting the sweetness of faith, and we talked about how uh, for many of us, it's kind of a cerebral. In the beginning, there's this cerebral kind of Islamic element to our practice, right? Um, it's I believe, I know I believe, right? Uh, but there's this deeper spiritual experiential knowledge that a person can gain where it's like they feel their belief on a deeper level than just thinking about it, just believing it. And a lot of times converts and a lot of people who go through difficulties in life, really hard situations where Allah pulls them out of that that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they have um, is at a whole nother experiential level. So we talked about uh, tasting the sweetness of faith last week uh, in our in our session, inshallah. So we also, this is just covering a few things. Uh, the other thing we talked about last week is good company. We talked about the importance of having uh, righteous people around you. Um, and we mentioned 
the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you should keep company with people. Man dhakarakum billahi ru'ya. This was a beautiful narration from last week. The person who when you see them, you remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we're going to actually talk a little bit more about that today. When you see them, they remind you of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That was number one. Then the hadith continued. And it said, and when they speak, your knowledge of the deen is increased. Right? So whenever they're talking something about the deen, something about Allah, something about akhirah, you're hearing those things and it increases your knowledge. amala. And then when you watch the person's actions, you remember the hereafter. And what we talked about is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who you can follow on social media, but the more you watch them, the more you think of dunya, the more you think of the world, the more you think of fame, the more you think of money, the more you think of cars, women, all of these things, the more you watch, you're like, man, I'm broke. You know what I mean? I'm broke, right? But but when you stay around people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can have all those blessings, right? You can have all of those things, but your heart is on a completely different level because you're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's where we left off yes, uh, last class. And we're going to pick up from here today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The author, he says these words. These are the two lines. I hope we get through both of these. But these are the two lines I want to focus on. The first thing he says, this is beautiful. Listen closely. He says, Lower yourself to the truth. Lower yourself to the truth, before the truth. And submit to it. Submit to it. Now, what is this talking about? First and foremost, the word tawadu in Arabic language means to be humble. It means to put yourself down. It means to lower yourself, right? Not to elevate yourself. It's the opposite, opposite of arrogance. It's tawadu. It's humility. Humble oneself. But what he says, he says something really deep. He says, He says, lower yourself before the truth and submit to it. What he's talking about is a reaction to truth. A reaction to truth. Many times when someone drops haq on you, we have this natural reaction to it where we, if you have a strong personality, you kind of entrench yourself. You kind of like, yo, back up. Right, you get defensive, and um, and what he's trying to teach us here is that no, the quality of a strong believer, and this is where as Muslims we gotta switch the paradigm. This is what this class is all about: switch the paradigm. The Prophet said, for example, he said the strong person isn't the one that slams someone; the strong one is the one that controls anger. He's switching the meaning of strength. Here, there's another understanding of a strong personality. The strong personality isn't the one who sticks to their guns, as they say in Texas, right? They stick to their guns. That means you hold your position no matter what. You're wrong, but you're like, nah, this is what it is. Uh-uh. The, the strong personality, it's actually harder on your nafs that when you're wrong, when the truth is presented to you, you're able to, to submit yourself and be like, you know what? I was wrong on that. I was, I was wrong on that. And the reason why this is so hard is we've, we've enthroned the self. What I mean by that is we've put the self at the highest point. Like whatever I feel, that's haq. That's true. And there is no other truth. So I won't humble myself. There was an interesting scenario that happened with Umar ibn Khattab. Umar ibn Khattab, we know he was a strong, he, he had this alpha strong personality. Right? If you study Sirah, you know Umar ibn Khattab was a strong man. But again, what does it mean to be a strong man from our Islamic paradigm? So there's this one incident that is really interesting. Hudayfa, listen to this story. Hudayfa radiallahu an, he says, he's like, one day I went to go see Umar ibn Khattab. And this was while he's Amir al-Mu'mineen, meaning he's the Khalifa. He's the caliph. He's running the whole show. He says, I walked in and I see Umar ibn Khattab is very sad. Like something's really bothering him. Something's really troubling him. So I said to him, what's, what's wrong, ya Umar al-Mu'mineen? What's, what's bothering you, O leaders of the, of the believers? 
Faqala, listen to what he says. And this is what I really want us to learn because right now our personality, a lot of us, if someone comes up to us and is like, yo, you know, this is how you're supposed to do it. A lot of times it's just like, yo, man, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Like we, we don't want to accept that. And what I want to show you is someone with this very alpha, strong personality. Look at his example. He's sitting there. He's sad. Hudayfa bin Yaman, he walks in. What's wrong with you? He, listen to what he says. He says, Inni akhaf an aqa'u fi munkar fala yanhani ahadun minku, minkum ta'zeeman li. He says, I fear that I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do something wrong. And none of you are going to correct me. None of you are going to correct me because of your respect for me. Like what? You feel what I'm saying? Makari, that's deep. Where we, we shun away from that person correcting us. Umar ibn Khattab is sitting there in a deep state of like sadness. Like, man, I'm messed up. His, but his boy comes in, yo, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm scared. Y'all respect me so much. You're not going to correct me. See, here's the, the deal. If you want to summarize this, you got to love the truth more than you love yourself. That's the key. If there's a one line to this thing right here, you got to love truth more than you love yourself. And it's, it's actually really difficult because um, like I just did some like basic research. I, my research skills ain't all that. But like from a neurological perspective, whenever like our whenever we're attacked, there's there's things that we become defensive. But ideological attacks are similar to physical attacks. We get defensive. So we naturally want to flee it. We naturally naturally want to uh, we find it uncomfortable. And one study, study that I was looking at was basically saying that they've done MRI scans on people who had very strong political views. And whenever they would read counter evidence to that, the, the places in the brain that relate to self-identity are just like lit up. And the places of the brain that deal with negative emotions. So what does this tell us? It tells us that neurologically, we, we have this negative reaction to being corrected, right? But when you look at Umar ibn Khattab's statement, that's on some other neurological stuff right there, man. Because he's he's flipped it. His identity isn't as important as truth for him anymore. Now, I don't want to take this wrong. Like one of the things, obviously, emotional intelligence is important when you're correcting wrong. I think uh, Ustad did a, a session two days ago on nasiha, right? On well-wishing. And well-wishing, giving advice to someone, you need to know how to give advice. I mean, you can't just be walking up to people like, you know, brothers be telling me stories, sisters be telling me stories. Like auntie just walked up to me and was like, yo, pull that down, you know? And she's like, yo, excuse me, my name is such and such, your name? You know what I mean? There was no introduction. So there's a way of nasiha, that's there. But our job is actually to love to be corrected because we love truth more than we love our own self-identity. So don't conflate the two. That person has a responsibility to learn how to correct people properly. That's between them and God, no doubt, 100%. And they need to learn that. But what's our reaction to the correction? You know what I'm saying? What's our reaction to the correction? You ever been on a team sport? Like a lot of people come out for team sports, they get cut first week because they don't like to be corrected. But the ones who excel are people who love correction. No, show me where I did wrong. Show me my mistake. And so when I read this statement of Umar ibn Khattab, I was like, like, what type of human being is this? You feel me? So what does he say? He says, like, I fear that I'm going to end up doing something wrong. And because I'm the leader of the believers now, none of you are going to correct me. Now, this, this is where you need good someone riding shotgun that's, that's, that's real. Shotgun, everyone. Okay, cool. The average age looks like they understand what I'm saying. So you, this is where you need someone who truly loves you for the sake of God. And I'm going to talk about this more at the end of today's class. But the people around you, you got to make sure they love you and Allah. They love Allah more than they love you almost. Why? Because what we're going to talk about at the end of class is people who tell you what you want to hear. Because of some benefit that they could get from you. We'll talk about that in a minute. We won't go too deep into that. So what did Udayfa say? Hudayfa, look what he says, radiallahu an. He says, Wallahi, uh-uh. Laura Ainaka, Kharashta Anil Haq, 
Lena Heinaka. He goes, no, no, hold up. If we see you get off track, we're stopping you, bro. We're stopping you. You know what Umar ibn Khattab said? I want you to remember this statement. Write it down. He says, Alhamdulillah, ladhi ja'ala li ashaban yuqawimunani idha a'wajajtu. He says, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah who has given me such company that will straighten me out when I get off track. So I guess what I'm just trying to highlight is we need to love the truth more than we love ourselves. And when you hear the truth, when you hear that coming to you, you need to be like, yes, alhamdulillah, that's what I need to do. That's what I need to do. There's another story of Umar ibn Khattab. By the way, there's a statement about Umar, and you can write this down. They say about him, Kana waqafan inda kitab Allah. Waqaf, you know, uh, waqf. You see a waqf sign. What does it mean? Stop, right? So they say about Umar, Kana waqafan inda kitab Allah. Like if you just recited a verse, he stopped right there. <laughs> a funny story. Uh, one of the Sahaba, I forget the name. I didn't write this story down. I wasn't going to share it, but it's hilarious. So, Umar ibn Khattab was a, was a tough guy with people under him, okay? So I'm a disc, this is a disclaimer for the story before I start, okay? So he had his uh, leaders coming to meet him very often to keep them in line, right? And so one of the, one of the uh, leaders had come to meet him, right? And this leader, actually, it was the cousin of a leader. The cousin said, hey, you're close to Umar. Why don't you let me get into the room with you guys? So the, the cousin's like, all right, cool, I'll get you in. So the moment he got him in, right away, you ever call somebody to something and that person starts showing out and now you look stupid because you invited them? You not know, no one's experienced, okay, cool, whatever. So this person, all of a sudden he starts showing out and he's like, yeah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you don't give us our haq, you don't do this, you don't do that. Now Umar ibn Khattab is on top of his game. So he gets up, and this is the part I was like, we don't condone, like, physical violence, right? But he gets up with his stick and he's about to hit the dude, okay? He was a tough guy, all right? Whatever. It was a different age. You could put it whatever bl block you want to put it in. He's about to hit him. And then that person reads the verse, Khudil afwa wa bil urf wa a'rid anil jahilin. The cousin who had invited him read this verse, grab on to forgiveness and overlook the ignorant people. The moment he heard it, he dropped the stick. He dropped it, let him go, whatever, bounce, leave. But the point is, how many of us, somebody say an ayah to you and you like, <laughs> you know, we're here like, yo, what are, you, what are you talking about? Yo, you're just using that for your own da 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 we, we might get more mad, right? There's there are statements when you use religion to do stuff. Isn't there something like that, right? Whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> right? Oh, you're using religion to kind of like manipulate me, like. You know, whatever. That's a whole different conversation. But the point I'm trying to say is he heard the verse and he just stopped. It was just like something inside of him triggered. There was one more story about this. Can I share one more story? So there was so so this is going to be funny to the brothers. There was a time when the mahars, you know, mahar, the dowry money was getting too high. Like sisters like, yo, you got to pay, yo. You got to pay heavy the dowry money to get married. So Umar ibn Khattab, he realized if dowry gets too high, then marriage becomes difficult, then zina becomes easy, right? So, so, so he's like, no, this is not good. Marriage is supposed to be extremely easy in Islam because the easier good deeds are, the harder sins become. Unfortunately, our communities have flipped that all over, but whatever. So, so he got on the member and he's talking in front of all of these sahaba that I'm going to put as a salary cap on the mahars. I'm gonna cap the mahar. I'm gonna cap cap the dowry. And all the you know sahaba, they're quiet. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's what's up. You know what I mean? And there's this one auntie, elderly Ajuza, in the back of the room. She goes, she stands up, she goes, Yabana Khattab, oh son of Khattab. She's older than him. She goes, Oh son of Khattab, you're not doing that. Allah says in the Quran. What is it? Qintaran. What's the verse? Qintaran. Fala ta'khudu minhu shay'a. Right? Allah says in the Quran, if you were to give a woman a qintar as her dawi, a qintar is this large amount of money. So the verse isn't actually about the amount of money, but the word is actually symbolizes a lot of money. 
So she says, God says, Qintar, who are you to, to uh who are you to limit it? Umar bin Khattab literally just got down the member. He says, Okay, I'm getting down the member. He just did he know the verse before? Of course he knew the verse. But whenever the verses of Quran were recited, he stopped right there. Nope, no more argument for me. I'm done. It's a beautiful quality, beautiful quality. And someone who's so strong, what I'm trying to show you is neurologically, it takes more strength to accept criticism and want to be corrected than to actually fight against the criticisms that come to you. Right? SubhanAllah. Beautiful example. So so um, what, is, what does he say? He says, uh, the book, what does the book say? He says, lilhaq. Submit yourself to the truth. Submit yourself to the truth. Lahu, and, and humble yourself before it. I read one more story. I'm sorry, there's a lot of stories today, man. SubhanAllah. I read one more story of a Qadi. Um, his name was Ubaidullah bin Hassan. And he was going to a janaza and he had his student with him. He had his student with him. His student asked him a question. And the Qadi said the answer, and the student knew in his head, he's like, no, nah, he got that wrong. So he said it to him. He said, he said, no, akhtata, Shaykh. He's like, you got that wrong. This is the correct answer. So the so the narration says, Ubaidullah, the Qadi, he was a Qadi at this time. He stops for a moment and he thinks, and he's like, You're right. But then he says these words, and I want you to write these words. He says, La'an akuna dana ban fil haq. Ahabu ilayya. This shook my core. He said, for me to be a tail, like of an animal, than a, a tail of haq, of truth, is more beloved to me than to be the head, the leader of falsehood. There's so much meaning there. There's so much meaning there. He's saying, like, I don't, if I'm wrong, I'll follow who's right. I'd rather be the tail of truth than the head of falsehood. And so many people today would want a platform to have, be the head, to be known, to be this, even though they know everything they say, they don't even believe in any of it. It's not even true. Why are you doing this? Yo, likes, man, followers, man. Social capital right there. So he says, For me to be the tail, you got it? Qadi is a leader, a judge. My bad. My bad, yo. Jazakallah khair. So, yes, let's go forward, inshallah. And as I said, this point here is all about loving truth more than you love yourself. As a convert, there's this moment where your self-identity is just smashed with converting. Like, you're, you're, you as an individual are like, 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 the truth just smashes against you. And there's a point where you have to say, I love the truth more than my, my own self-identity. And that makes you a stronger person. That makes you a stronger person. May Allah make us of those people who, when we see the truth. Last week, I think it was two weeks ago, we read this, this dua. Oh Allah, allow me to see the truth as truth and allow me to follow it. See? See, someone tells you the truth. Now I know it's the truth, but my brain doesn't like to follow it now because it, does, it feels attacked. Just switch it. You're not being attacked. You're being helped. You're not being attacked. You're being helped. You're being guided. May Allah accept. Any questions on that one? I'm going to go to the next one, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu <clears throat> Okay. So then he says, وَأَدِمْ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ qurba." This is beautiful. He says, and constantly remain in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tanal qurba, you will get closeness to Allah. You will get closeness to Allah. For the remainder of today's session, and we might go to a little bit more, but I want to talk about this concept because I think as young Muslims, I'm talking young, like, you know, 30s and down, all right? Uh, as young Muslims, I don't think we really understand the, the, the pivotal role that dhikr, like this word we hear all the time, and I'm going to translate it. Uh, dhikr is the remembrance of God, right? That's our easiest way of translating it. But I think there's a lot of like spiritual problems we go through, guys, a lot. 
And we, the only issue is that we haven't attached ourselves to enough dhikr of Allah, enough remembrance of Allah. That remembrance of Allah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a, a key element of our spiritual development. And it's something we've heard from Sunday school. We've learned the subhanAllah, subhanAllahs after the salawat. We've learned all this, but we haven't understood how pivotal it actually is for your spiritual well-being and your spiritual progression. And so that's what I'm going to I'm going to talk about. What does he say? His words are adim dhikrullah, constantly remain in the state of dhikr of Allah. Why is he saying this? Let's go back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When they were when when the azwaj mutahara, his wives were asked to describe what was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam like, they say kana yadhkrullah ala kulli ahyanihi. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was always engaged in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly engage. Now, what's the consequence? What's one of the effects of that remembrance of God? First of all, let's let's back up. Let's back up. Um, in this dunya, we're away from God. Meaning, before we were created, the Quran tells us that our souls saw Allah, believed in Allah, and then were sent to this dunya. We can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. So in this world, we're our way, away from Allah. But our souls... This is deep. I really want you to understand the depth of dhikr. Our souls have this natural affinity for Allah. It, they, our soul loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's its natural connection. And that's what the Quran teaches us. It is through the remembrance of God that the heart, the soul finds comfort. So the souls already recognize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're not in Jannah anymore. We're not in that spiritual metaphysical world. We're in the dunya. And the dunya is dis the designed by design. How is it designed? As a distraction. That's literally the purpose of the dunya. To distract us and take us away from that state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to put us into that ghafla. The word ghafla means heedlessness. This is, this is a very important. Allah In Surah Al-Kahf, we read it every week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how the, the world has been made beautiful. Why was it made beautiful? Well, if it was not beautiful, it wouldn't have been a good test. The purpose is that we're here away from Allah. And despite the beauty of the dunya, we overpower that. And our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overpowers our love for this dunya. So what does this have to do with dhikr, Mikael? Like, all right, I get it. We're in the dunya. The dunya is beautiful. My soul loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where dhikr comes in. The purpose, the, the, the way you bring the self and the mind back in, in, in line with the soul is by reminding it and, 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 and reminding it of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's say this again. The soul already desires God. It desires this deep connection with Allah. But the mind, the body, all of these things, the dunya pulls us away. What the remembrance of Allah does, this is so important to understand. What the remembrance of Allah does is it's reminding the body and the mind, come back to the soul. Come back to where the soul is. Come back to where the soul is. The idea is to constantly bring that body and mind back in line with the soul. That's the function of it. So spiritually speaking, there's two states that we can ever be in. Spiritually speaking... There are two states. One is called ghafla or to be sleep, heedless. The other is called yaqadha. Yaqadha means to be woke. Woke. Now it's interesting how they use the word woke today because we actually have a similar understanding of wokeness. For us, the, the yaqadha or wokeness is this, this awareness of the reality of the world and what I'm here for. You feel me? So you're walking around, it's like in the matrix, you're walking around and you're like, I know this whole deal. I'm aware of what this is. You can't play me. I know what this is all about. I know why I'm here. But when you enter into a state of ghafla, sleep, and that's why Ali radiallahu an, you know what he used to say? This is a beautiful statement. Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, he used to say this statement, the people are sleeping and when they die, they wake up. So wake up before time comes. People are sleeping. When they die, they wake up. But he's like, but wake up before time comes. What he's trying to say is you can enter this state of being aware of Allah, cognizant of Allah before it's too late. And that's what we're, we're talking about right now. So, so the Prophet, his whole day is dhikr of Allah. 
And when we look at some of these ahadith, I'm just going to share just a, a few narrations. The Rasul Sallallahu he said, لَأَنْ أَقُولَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا طَلَعْتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ Very powerful hadith, and they're so powerful, we sometimes like brush them aside. I want to talk about this hadith. Rasul Sallallahu he said, سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ What you knew since Sunday school. Rasul Sallallahu said, أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ It is more beloved to me than مَا طَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ Anything that the sun uh, rises upon, meaning this world. So what we're seeing here is that this is something extremely, extremely important to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. One more hadith and then we're going to go deeper into this. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one man, he came to him. And the rajul and qala, ya Rasulullah. This man came up. You know, sometimes the Bedouins, they would come and they would ask these kind of like uncultured questions, but they were on point. So one of them, he comes, he asks a question. He goes, ya Rasulullah, um, all of the rulings of Islam are just a lot for me. This is his words. Just a lot. There's a lot there. He says, can you just tell me one thing that I could just do and I'm good? Like, I love this Sahabi, yo. You know what I mean? It's beautiful. He's like, yo, just, just give me one thing. One thing, I'm, I'm good. Rasul, these are the words. لا يزال لسانك رتبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue always moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means this constant state of remembrance. Now, let's, let's talk about this on a deeper level. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala serves a role of affirmation as well. You know, like, what is an affirmation? An affirmation is a statement about something. Allahu Akbar, right? Subhanallah. Those are statements. It's a, it's like a, a mubtada khabar. It's a subject predicate statement. It's a factual statement. I'm saying Allah is the greatest, right? What happens is when we repeat these affirmations, these things become how we look at life. And so a lot of times when you're dealing with things and you just spiritually can't get over it, you haven't been doing enough dhikr, meaning the spiritual affirmations, to make yourself see this in the correct light. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Let me give an example. Here's one dhikr. I'm sure you may have heard your grandma say this or someone. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbi Allah. Just that. What does it mean? Allah is enough for me. Allah is enough for me. Things aren't working. Job isn't working. Someone cuts you off on the road, coming down. So something happens that's not your way. Hasbi Allah. Allah is enough for me. What happens to our hearts is when we repeat that throughout our lives, over a portion of our lives, that just becomes how we look at life. That's how we look at life. And now as problems come, something happens. You're like, Hasbi Allah. It's just the first thing that came to your mind. And I've shared this story with you before. I'll share it one more time. In the times of difficulty, whatever is truly inside, that's what comes out. I've told you this one story, and I'm going to repeat it because it, it, it speaks volumes. <sighs> okay, my wife is smiling at me. All right. So listen, Qasim was only a week old. For y'all, my man Qasim, he's running around here, right? So he was only a week home. We're driving home from a halakha, right? Uh, just like this, subhanAllah, right? Back in Baltimore. We're driving home. It's late at night. It's like 1130, right? And one of my, my I call him my ace, okay? You, you understand? Like, I guess what y'all, BF, BFF, BB, whatever. <laughs> what do y'all call it? Whatever, whatever. Anyways, he's right next to me. He had went to the halakha too, all right? So he's next to me, and uh, my wife is in the back, right? And Qasim is only a week old, right? There he is right there running around. And the two other kids are in the car too, in their car seats. We're sitting at a red light, 1130 at night, right? College Park, uh, Maryland. All of a sudden, he's asking me a question about tafsir. And I was mad tired. It was a halakha. Yo, on the ride home, don't be asking me tafsir questions, yo. I'm tired from the halakha, bro. So he's asking me, he's like, yo, surah yasin, da, da, da. In the moment he said that, I heard this screeching from behind and this car just like smashes into us, right? Hard, at least going like 60 miles an hour, okay? Right, the car, our car spins into the to middle thing and actually like bursts into flames, like legit bursts into flames, right? It's crazy. Everyone's safe. You can see them all there now, so it's all good, right? <laughs> it was crazy, right? But here's the deal. The moment the car hit, my man next to me, the first thing that he yelled 
was Allah. The first thing, the car hit, the first thing I heard, I heard it clear as day. He was like, Allah. When everything calmed down, I was like, bro, come here, yo. Give me a hug, yo. Give me a hug, man. Because you can't fake that. You, it's, it's, it's what's in the heart that comes out. When you squeeze a sponge, whatever's inside is what comes out. And so what I'm trying to say is that this dhikr, what it does, when you get yourself into a state of dhikr, when you get squeezed, the remembrance of Allah is what comes out. Because that's what you've, you've, you've filled the sponge with. And unfortunately, we're filling our sponges with so many other things. When we get squeezed, we're like, all this other stuff is coming out of us. Anxiety, worry, this, that, whatever. So my, my point is the function of dhikr, it, 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 it connects your heart in the times of ease to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when those times of difficulty come, you go back to the default, whatever is. And you know what's funny? You know the hadith, and maybe you don't know it, but there's a hadith about when we die, the angels will come and ask us three questions. The angels will ask us, who's your Lord? What's your religion? What do you say about this man, Muhammad? Right? And I used to always think, like, why can't they just lie? You know what I mean? Like, just, yo, I just make something up. So one of my teachers, he said it so beautifully. He's like, you don't get it. At that moment, what comes out is what was in. Jazakallah. What comes out was what was in. They can't fake. It's too scary. It's too intense. So what, what comes out of them is what they've been putting in their whole life. And uh, yeah, tissue. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make here, the point I'm trying to make is that one of the things we as young Muslims need to really do is on those drives to and from class and to and from work, like seriously, dhikr of Allah, man. Like connect your heart to remembrance of Allah. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Something like that. Right? It, it's, it's something that really rescues your heart. Uh, and I'm going to actually show you. So what did he say? He said the effect of dhikr is closeness to Allah. Closeness. Ibn Qayyim al Jozi, he actually mentioned in his book, uh, prophetic inv invocations, he mentioned over like 66 different virtues of dhikr. I'm going to share a lot of them with you right now. Y'all want to hear the, these virtues, inshallah? I'm going to go through these virtues because you can get a better understanding of what this does for you. So um, he says here, here are some, I'm not going to read all of them just because uh, it's, it's, it's a bit lengthy, right? So number one, <clears throat> bismillah, he says, Yurdar Rahman, it brings the pleasure of God. Shaytan, it pushes shaitan away. This is based on a hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu taught us Hanas, right? The Prophet Sallallahu this is a hadith to Rasul that sitting over the heart of each and every one of us is a shaitan. That whenever we're not engaged in the dhikr of Allah, injects thoughts into our minds and our hearts. But the moment you remember Allah, it backs away. So that's the function of that dhikr, right? Pushing shaitan away. Number three, Yazilul Ham. It takes away worries. Now, this will happen when your dhikr's on a deeper level. Like, you know, man, some of the OGs, man, some of the OGs that we used to see just converted, when they did their 33 after the salah, you know how these brothers did it, man? Subhanallah. 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 You're like, yo, but we're gonna be here for a minute, yo. <laughs> But 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 they would really like, like the 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 the, the meaning of the word was present. What are you saying, man? What you saying? You are you reflecting on what you're saying? Nah, man. The reason I'm saying why the reflection is because, like that, Alhamdulillah, it actually the meaning of it is what's going to help you. It's not just the word; it's the meaning. But the meaning becomes ingrained in the heart with the reflection. Upon recitation. Did that make sense? You feel me? Alhamdulillah. So it takes away worries. Number four, it brings happiness to the heart. Again, the soul already loves Allah. You, you know how you feel, subhanAllah, you get that fudger in. You know what I mean? You know that day where you get the fudger in right on time? Maybe you was in the front stuff, you got to the masjid. You feel a joy inside, right? 
That's the effect of dhikr as well. Um, it makes your heart stronger. In life, there are difficulties that we go through, man. Sickness, financial, family. You need a strong heart for these things. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know where al-qalb wal wajh. Ah Allah. It brings nur to your heart and your face. Right? So you get that dhikr in and the face starts shining, man. Alhamdulillah. What's Abdullah been up to, man? Alhamdulillah. He's shining. Wa yajlibu rizq Brings more risk. Risk means sustenance. Wealth. Food. Provisions. Brings these things. Yurithu al-muhabbat Allah. It brings love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. It takes away the rust. This is interesting. The Prophet said that one of the effects of the dunya on your heart is it gets rusty. Just because we're living here, man, we see wealth, we see this, we see that, we see this, all of these things, beautiful things. The heart gets rusty from akhirah. It's like it's not shining. The Prophet said that dhikr of Allah is what's going to clean that off. Before I go further, you know one thing that happens to us? Shaitan makes us feel like we're too dirty to do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's purely from shaitan. Ignore that. Ignore that. Shaitan, shatana, means the one pushed away from Allah. Of course he's going to, misery loves company. Of course he's going to keep you away from dhikr. Any, any moments you find remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taking away of sins, elevating one's uh, uh, status in the akhirah. Yuhditul uns. It creates this affinity between you and Allah. Like you, you, you feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a whole list of them. These are just some of the benefits of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I mentioned in jest that quick dhikr that we do sometimes, right? Subhanallah, 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 right? Now, I want to share with you something that Ibn Atala al-Askandari said about that. And it actually will encourage you a lot. So listen to what he says. This is very deep. This is from the Hikam. The Hikam is written by Ibn Atayla al-Askandari. Misser in the house, mashallah. Right? Uh, beautiful, beautiful advice. Listen to what he says here. La tatruk dhikr li adami hudurika ma'allah fihi. Do not stop doing dhikr because you are not present in the dhikr of Allah, in the remembrance of Allah. Don't stop. You feel me? What did I just say? Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. So in our mind, shaitan, like, see, you, why are you doing it? Don't do it. Uh-uh. Don't let shaitan play you. He says, don't ever give up dhikr. Don't ever give up dhikr because of your lack of presence. He says next, لِأَنَّ غَفْلَتُكَ عَنْ وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ أَشَدُّ مِنْ غَفْلَتِكَ فِي وُجُودِ ذِكْرِهِ Because your heedlessness from his remembrance is far worse than heedlessness in his remembrance. <sighs> no? Snaps? None? Yeah, that was heavy, no? You, you get it, right? Let me, uh, yeah, thank you. There you go. Somebody had to say, say it again. He said, because your heedlessness from the remembrance of God completely is worse than your heedlessness in the remembrance of God. What that means is, subhanAllah, 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 but my mind's not there. I'm driving. I'm all in traffic. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha. I'm not really thinking about the words, right? I, I, I'm trying to focus on the road. But he's like, that type of dhikr where you're heedless in the dhikr is far better than being heedless from dhikr altogether. Make sense now? But then what, what does he say next, man? He says, fa'asa an yarfa'uk. He's like, who knows? Maybe Allah will lift you up. Who knows? Maybe Allah will lift you from, because of that dhikr you were doing with a heedless mind, maybe Allah will lift you from a state of dhikr, heedless to a dhikr of awareness. Because of the barakah of that, the blessing of that dhikr that you were doing. Right? Learning's there. But the point I wanted us to understand is that the true connection with dhikr comes when you actually stop and think about those words that you're saying and you're like, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And you really reflect on those words and let them imprint upon your heart. So these are just a few um, 
just some points on 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 Dikr. Honestly, I told you guys, there's two doors that I think are the doors of wilaya. Wilaya means friendship with God. If you want to become a wali of Allah in today's age, a friend of God, there's only two things. One is to leave out, the other is to do. And you know what it is? Number one thing you need to do is just dhikr of Allah. Everything else, everything else. And the other thing is control the gaze, control the eyes. If you control your eyes, that's it. Control your eyes, dhikr of Allah. I'm going I'm to bring up one more thing though. Imam Ghazali says this. All of these hadith talk about how great dhikr is, right? Remembrance of Allah, how great it is. He goes, wait, but dhikr is easy. Hajj is hard. Salah is hard. Zakat is hard. Hajj, all of these things are like literally physically difficult to do. How is dhikr better than all of these things? And there's so many hadith that literally say that. He says, this is the reason why. And you're going to love this. This is so beautiful. He says, all of the other forms of worship that we do are for the purpose of putting your heart in a state of dhikr. So don't treat it like, oh, I don't got to do it because I'm woke. Someone like, yo, why don't, why don't you pray? Because I'm woke already, yo. The purpose of the prayer was to wake me up. I'm already woke spiritually. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, bro, chill. You, you guys still got to do what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, right? So, but the point, this is beautiful. The prayer, the hajj, the zakat, they're, they're a means to this awakening, this point of being aware and, and remembering Allah. So he says those are means, but the dhikr is the objective. The dhikr is the objective. That's why it's so easy, but it's such a, a beloved thing to Allah because it's the actual objective of all aqim uh, salat li dhikri. Allah says in the Quran right there. Aqim salat li dhikri, surah Taha, right? Surah Taha. Establish the prayer to remember me. The purpose of that is to remember Allah. That's why dhikr is such a great thing. Why am I spending this much time? Because it's something that we take so lightly, but truly, 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 all of my teachers, the, 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 the thing that they focused on the most with us, your tongue remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Just these forms of dhikr. Don't take it lightly. Allahu Akbar. Okay, so we go forward. How much time do we have to Maghrib? Five minutes? Huh? Oof. Okay, one more line. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu It's just connected to the previous line as well. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah he said, Julasa, the people that will be sitting close to Allah on Yawm al Qiyamah, the day of resurrection, are the people of humility and uh, uh, the people of humility, the people of awe and fear, and the people who, people who remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly. I'm going to leave with one thing. Whenever we finish any blessing, we end it with alhamdulillah, right? Whenever you finish eating, alhamdulillah, right? Whenever you finish any blessing, alhamdulillah, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that we are the ummah of hamd. Hamd means praise. We are the ummah of hamd. What does hamd mean? Praise of Allah. We will, he said we will be under a flag on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Can you, yo, can you imagine? Like as the flags of the different ummahs are set up and everyone's going their own way. The Prophet Sallallahu said, our flag will be the liwa'ul hamd, the flag of, the flag of hamd. Why? Because our Prophet is Muhammad. Right? Hamd is in his name. Hamd means praise is in his name. And Why? Because he's the last of the prophets. So when you're done with every blessing, you end with alhamdulillah. We are the ummah of hamd, brothers and sisters. That means regardless of your sins, stop thinking about your sins. Focus on dhikr of Allah. That's it. Focus on dhikr of Allah. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, walla ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. But do it regularly. You know, when, when you go to the gym, you don't go to the gym and just randomly lift stuff. I brought this up before. You go, you're like, no, I'm doing 25. It's leg day. You know what I mean? 
It's, it's upper body. I'm doing 25 of this, 10 of this, eight rep, uh, four reps of eight of this, right? Similarly with Vika, you should have a little bit of a checklist how much you want to do. You know what I mean? How much you want to do. Put something there. Small goals, nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Because after today's joint, you're going to be like, yeah, I'm doing a thousand la 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 laws. Tomorrow, man, you're going to be like, yo, woo, let's do, let's do five. <laughs> so, ma qalla wa kafa. The Prophet Sallallahu said, what is little but enough? That's what you start with. There was a Sahabi. Every prayer he would read, Qul Allahu ahad. So everyone started like, yo, do you know any more Quran, bro? Is there, do you know any more? They complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Every time the Imam you put, every time he leads, he leads, Qul Allahu ahad. We think he don't know no more Quran. Prophet Sallallahu called him. Why do you only read? He's like, because I love it. He's like, Allah loves you because of your love of that surah. So, Joe, pick one thing. SubhanAllah is your joint. Man, that's your door to Jannah, man. SubhanAllah is my dhikr. That's what you do. So, dhikr of Allah. Yes. Yes. Allahu Akbar. Really, that was Allahu like, Akbar. Like, even like with Americans, like, I'll be sitting there, you know, I'm talking and they're talking in English, and I'm like, oh yeah, inshallah. inshallah I do that all the time. Like, like, oh, Yo, know, the workers at my house, I hit like five Jazakallahs. I was like, oh, dang, man, what am I doing, man? No, can I share that, that she said a dua? I don't think the brothers heard. I'm so happy that Allah put that in your heart. There's a prophetic supplication that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made after prayer. This is so important. Write it in English. Just know what it means. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatika. Oh Allah, this is beautiful. Oh Allah, a'inni, help me ala dhikrika to remember you. Help me remember you. It's like telling my wife, help me remember your birthday. <laughs> like what? With Allah, it's okay. Alhamdulillah. Because Tawfiq is from Allah. She'll be like, set a reminder. You better know it. Oh, Allahumma a'ini. Isn't it beautiful? We're turning to Allah to help us remember him. Allahumma a'ini ala dhikrika wa shukrika. Oh, make sure you don't say shik, shik, shirkika, right? <laughs> shukrika. Okay. Uh, ala dhikrika wa shukrika. Oh, Allah, help me uh, uh, remember you and help me be grateful. And wa husni ibadatika. And help me worship you in a beautiful way. Can you imagine you come to Yom al Qiyamah? On Yom al Qiyamah, you've been saying this dua your whole life? Like, I've been asking you, Ya Allah, for this. May Allah give us tawfiq. Thank you so much for sharing that. JazakAllah khair. Any other questions before we uh, conclude? Alhamdulillah, man. May Allah make us of people who remember Him often. You know, I think our parents in the elder generation, they know dhikr, yo. They heard it from the balad for a long time, right? But I wanted to talk about dhikr for us, man, because those long drives to work and from work and here and there, man, we could be racking up good deeds, man. And we could be racking up a relationship with Allah. Just may Allah make us of people who remember Allah often, inshallah. Man, we used to have a cook at our school. Every meal, man, he used to be make the whole meal. He was remembering Allah the whole time. Blessed food, man. Blessed. طيب إن شاء الله جزاك الله خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسيفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاك الله خير everyone we'll pray مغرب right now إن شاء الله استغفر الله yeah. Who said all the other forms of worship is to put you in the same Ghazali. Ghazali. Mm -hmm. The hadith about uh, the and the and the and the and the they both mean humble. So it was and and wada. Uh, here, let me show you.
here. Khadi'una mutawadi'una. Khadi'una mutawadi. They both basically mean uh, humility. Well, khaifuna, those with fear, with zakiruna, and those of remembrance of Allah. Yeah, he wrote a book called Wabil Wabil Asayyid. 